iMovie fans, on today's episode, we talk to the writer of Blair Witch, Simon Barrett, the newest tactical Batman suit, and a Stan Lee action biopic. Oh, by the way, Theater 12 is on your right. Enjoy the movie. It's time for Film HQ. Guys, and welcome to this week's episode of Film HQ right here on Comic-Con HQ. My name is John Kaby. I'll be your host today, and we've got a lot of ground to cover, but before we do, we want to make sure you're caught up to date with everything going on in the world of movie news. So let's go to our news update with Josh and Haletta. Thanks, John. Hey, guys, I'm Josh Makuga. I am Haletta Olamu. And here is this week's news. Guardians of the Galaxy 2 doesn't grace theaters until May 5th of 2017, but two stars of the movie teased fans with some details on what to expect. Kurt Russell, who will join Join the cast as Peter Quill's father, Ego the Living Planet, told press that it'll be more of a family drama and the dilemmas facing an estranged father and son. While Chris Pratt, who will reprise his role as Star-Lord, aka Peter Quill, said, it's gonna be the biggest spectacle movie ever. Son and father not seeing eye to eye already? I smell drama. <laughs> Super Troopers 2 production started last week in Boston, and this week, according to Deadline, added Rob Lowe, star of every 80s movie where they needed a hot guy, to the cast as Guy Lafranc, a former hockey star, now the mayor of a Canadian border town. A French Canadian Rob Lowe. Oh, ho, ho, get your fingers out of my poutine. <laughs> Is that a good friend? Oh, <laughs> isn't it? You know that. That was perfect. <laughs> According to The Hollywood Reporter, the Fifty Shades Darker trailer broke the Star Wars The Force Awakens trailer record with over 114 million views in the first 24 hours across all platforms. <laughs> all right. Everybody knows you don't see actual nudity, right? Like, it's just half-decent acting and possible s and M. I just... Haletta, just, just start talking, I might explode. I, <laughs> Take it easy, man. <sighs> Zack Snyder, director of the upcoming Justice League movie, posted a photo of Ben Affleck in the newest bat suit, complete with goggles and much heavier armor. The Batman tactical suit, as it's so lovingly being called, broke the internet with reactions from everyone, including George Clooney, who exclaimed, we've been over this, the nipples were not my idea. I, st I still didn't mind the nipples, but maybe that's true. <laughs> Remember that movie, The Rundown, where The Rock just basically exploded Brazil while beating up Stifler every chance he got? Yeah, well, apparently director Peter Berg still has hope for a sequel, especially if it starred Jonah Hill alongside The Rock. Berg was quoted as saying, if Hill were available today, we'd start filming. And especially if The Rock was still available, you know, if he could carve 600 extra hours in a 24-hour day. The Rundown fan waits patiently. Very patiently. In our first ever back-to-back, -back, The Rock being too busy to be in a sequel movie news, G.I. Joe fans will have to wait for a third installment of the franchise, thanks to the actor's busy schedule. Young Hun Lee, the actor who plays Storm Shadow, confirmed to Latino Review Media that the studio is waiting for actors' schedules to clear, especially The Rock, who recently answered a call from the studio saying, oh, hey, yeah, um, hold on, I'm getting into an elevator. Let me call you back. I mean, come on. <laughs> Fox Searchlight has secured distribution rights to Jackie, the biopic of Jackie Kennedy, and the hours and days following the assassination of John F. Kennedy, starring Natalie Portman in the title role. The movie will get an Oscar-friendly release date on December 9th, which basically means you can find me at the theaters crying alone. Mm -hmm. I'm a sensitive guy. You are. So, in what appears to be the funniest yet interesting piece of news this week, Fox bought the life rights to famed comic book writer Stan Lee and planned to turn those life rights into a 1970s style action movie akin to Kingsman, Secret Service, or Roger Moore's James Bond. Just to be clear, Stan Lee wasn't actually an international spy, right? I, was he? Wait, was Stan Lee a spy? I don't, I don't think so. I just think. James Gunn, director of Guardians of the Galaxy, debuted a movie he wrote and produced called The Belco Experiment at the Toronto International Film Festival to rave reviews and was sold to Orion and Blumhouse Tilt. The film, directed by Greg McLean, takes place in an office building where employees must murder each other to survive a cruel social experiment. Spoiler alert, the only person to live is Diane and accounts receivable because she didn't ask James Gunn about the Guardians of the Galaxy 2 trailer. Smart move, Diane, smart move. I'm Josh McCuga. <laughs> and I'm Alet Olamu. And that's this week's news. Now it's time to take a look at the new movies hitting theaters this weekend in this week's Critics Corner. So 
Does well, no. Oliver Stone likes the really light-hearted movies. He <laughs> likes to go after that really easy kind of subject matter. But he has come out with one that I think caught a lot of people's attention with Snowden. Of course, everything about the guy who blew the whistle on the government spying on their own citizens. A lot of people have a lot of very different heated opinions on both sides of it. But anyway, Mark, you watched this film the other night. What did you come out of Snowden with? Well, I thought it was the worst movie to see right before you go to bed. Because <laughs> as soon as I closed my eyes, I just saw a bunch of computerized numbers. It was like I was in the Matrix. I'm Googling jo I'm, I'm Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Snowden. I'm Googling Snowden. I'm looking at American Airlines tickets, how expensive it is to fly to Moscow right now. <laughs> but after all that, I started really being impressed with what Oliver Stone was able to get out of Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Because Joseph mm. Gordon-Levitt is one of the best actors we have working today. Everybody knows that. But for him to pull off Snowden and make me believe that I'm not watching an actor, I'm actually watching this guy go through this journey, and to have him be so closely resembling in both voice intonation and his face was exactly like Snowden. I thought that was one of the more impressive things about the movie. Like, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was so convincing in the film, but if something was gnawing, I mean, I figured it out. I felt like watching the movie that Joseph Gordon-Levitt was playing Keanu Reeves, playing Edward Snowden. <laughs> That's what it felt like a little bit to me watching the film. But here's one of the ironic things about the film, is that quite often, like with a movie like Sully, I was really impressed with Sully because they didn't really make the movie about the plane going down in the Hudson. They made the movie about the people surrounding it, right? And a lot of times I love that when they connect it to the human part of the story. Watching Snowden, I actually felt the opposite. I felt like when they're going into the more human parts of Snowden, like with the relationship between him and his girlfriend, stuff like that, those are the parts that kind of lost me in the movie. And when they got back to the actual events of what he discovered, how his mind started to change about what he needed to do, those are the parts I was most interested in, which I thought was very odd that I felt that it way. It was a little bit like Oliver Stone wanted to really focus on the trees, and we might have missed some of the forest there. But yeah. I will say that Shailene Woodley was magnificent in the movie, I've too. never seen her better. And she did a great job of humanizing Snowden for us. Because yes. Snowden on his own, yeah. he's just this thing that exists in our world, and it's almost like he's a droid, which we don't mm -hmm. really give the credibility of having human emotion. But seeing Woodley's performance, be able to bring that out of Levitt's performance, mm -hmm. was really fascinating. But you're right, I wanted to know more about the actual thing that Snowden is famous for, which is somebody who used to work on the, on the innermost circles of the NSA and the CIA, and then taking that information and making it public. I wanted to get a little more meat on that bone. I agree with that. But anyway, by the end of it, what do you end up giving Snowden out of 10? I think I would still give Snowden a positive score. I think I'd be in the six and a half range on Snowden. I'll, I'll do 6.5 out of 10 because I think Oliver Stone still has his fastball when it comes to making movies. It's not his best by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's an important conversation to have and Snowden watching the film can start it. You know, I'm right with you. I thought this was a good movie that missed out on a couple of opportunities to make it great, mm -hmm. but I'm still going to go with a solid 6.5 as well. You want to go to Moscow with me? I I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's it's buy our like tickets. It's three layovers, and you got to walk through a painting. It's a long way to get to <laughs> Moscow, but I think it's going to be worth it. All right, now, one of the other big films, of course, that is opening this week that a lot of people are talking about, especially since Comic-Con, is the new Blair Witch film, a.k.a. The Woods, a.k.a. the new Blair Witch film. <laughs> so this has now come out, dropped the bomb at Comic-Con that got everybody by surprise. It got everybody buzzing about it. When I up, you had a chance to go see Blair Witch. What did you think of this incarnation of it? Well, this version, this new found footage kind of film, like, let me just say, like, I'm not a fan of paranormal activity or any of these kind of, like, spooky, like, I'm walking around for an hour and a half and, oh, and then credits. <laughs> I'm just not into those kinds of films. With that being said, having seen Blair Witch 18 years ago, this is a worthy successor. They're basically throwing Book of Book of Shadows into, into the, the shadows. Yeah, that's, 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 that <laughs> never happened. The weird videotaped orgy. We don't know what that's about. Here's some more found footage stuff. And I like the team up of, of Simon and Adam. They're a really good team. And I think they worked really well together making this film, putting in all the new technology, new video cameras, drones, all kinds of things that help layer this film up, which mm. is basically a remake of the first film. So unfortunately for me, like, there are some scares in there for me. I think people who love these kinds of films are gonna dig it. Mark, what do you think about it? John, I never wanna have kids. Um, <laughs> and if I ever do have children and they come to me and they say, Daddy, can we go camping? I'm gonna say, sure, we can go camping. I just got a couple flicks you should watch before we go into the woods. And Blair Witch is gonna be one of them because I had a ball watching this movie. I'm a fan of the original and I love the promise of the original, how it set us up for these found footage horror movies, some of which have been entertaining 
entertaining, some not so much since 1999. Sure. But for Adam Wingard to take us back into this world and embrace the mythology and add to it, not in a Jenga way where it's like, well, now you're kind of cheapening what the first film experience was. It built off the lore so well. The fact that we get to go back into the woods and somebody has a connection to one of the original people that went in. Heather, she was Miss Snotbubble. She, that was her. Yeah. And now that her little brother, who's very younger in age, comes in and is looking to see her, and we have all this new technology now, I thought that the myth building worked really well. I think sometimes they'd introduce a new element into this mm, Blair Witch, right. and it didn't necessarily pay off the way I wanted it to. But I think that if you're a real horror fan, and you're a real fan of Blair Witch, I should say, and of that lore, you're going to love this movie because you're going to be looking at it really closely and you're going to say that's a tiny difference and that's a nice step forward, albeit a small one. Mm. If you're somebody who's not really invested in Blair Witch at all, you don't care about found footage horror movies, you might look at this thing with a telescopic lens and say, this is a lot like the first one, what's new here? There's a lot of new stuff, you just have to find it. Yeah, for me going into it, I was really impressed with the way they quickly acknowledged technology's changed since mm. the first Blair Witch. Every single person can have a little video camera in their earpiece now. You mentioned the drones, and I found, especially through the first half of the film, they really took advantage of the fact that, hey, we have an excuse to have seven different camera angles oh. <laughs> to do our shots and still call it a found footage movie. I felt like it was very... You mentioned that it's a worthy successor, and I felt it really does honor the first film quite a bit. Mm -hmm. There certainly are moments where you get those initial feelings of creepiness, like yeah. a lot. I found in the first, like, say, two acts that you're right. They introduced some new elements that you weren't expecting to see. Unfortunately, maybe they didn't pay off as much mm -hmm. near the end, but they felt good in the buildup. Unfortunately for me, I felt like Blair Witch missed a little bit of an opportunity to really make it its own movie and to make it its own sequel, if you will. And they fell back to some points where it felt a little bit too similar to the original for me personally. But still overall, when I came out of theater, I was like, this is a good movie, and I enjoyed it. I do wish it paid off a little bit better than it did. So I'm not going to love the film, but I did like it. I'm going to end up recommending it. For me, I'm going to give the film another 6.5 out of 10. Mark, what about you? I'm going higher. I'm going to go 8 out of 10 for this new Blair Witch. And if for no other reason, whoever found the footage and put it on again, who's hiking and finds, like, 19 different cameras and is like, well, I got two years to kill. I'll cobble all this stuff together right. and show it to people. <laughs> but it was worth it, damn it. And uh, that editor, that's why I'm giving it a six. Because <laughs> it, at the, even at the beginning, there's those weird, bleh, 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 like you're like, hey man, make a little smoother transitions. Make it creepy at the end, but you don't have to add those. Use weird... iMovie or something. I you know, man. Smooth that. that out, baby. Use those magnetic clipo things or whatever, man. Smooth that out. But, you know, and I will add a little thing like uh, the Burkittsville couple. I like that couple, the weirdos who yes. had the extra old, like, 90s camera. Hey man, I, I still use tape. I liked that couple and their little <laughs> mythos that they added to the book. Blair Witch. All right, guys, we're sitting here with the writer of the new Blair Witch, Simon Barrett. Simon, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. How did you first get connected to Blair Witch, and what was your reaction to when you even started to consider doing another Blair Witch film? Lionsgate, who'd bought your next, kind of invited uh, Adam and I to like this super secret meeting in Santa Monica where like they wouldn't put anything in writing. They wouldn't tell us what it was on the phone. And we were like, okay, it's either like a Twilight spinoff, which like, mm. if so, they like, <laughs> if so, this is going to be a really awkward conversation. <laughs> Um, or it's something that like we can't even guess at, um, and 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 we sat down with them and they're like, you know, we own the rights to the Blair Witch Project and we've been talking for years about doing a new one, and we really think like you guys might be the right people to do it because um, they'd seen how we kind of collaborated and how we worked together. So that was creatively exciting, but it was also kind of creatively daunting because I've never worked with anyone else's mythology before. Um, you know, I, I mean, I would be willing to write a Star Wars movie, but no one, no one, <laughs> no, no one has asked me. So, so I've been kind of just Kathleen having, Kennedy, if you're watching, I've just been coming up with my own stuff. Lionsgate knew they really wanted a very direct sequel to the original. They wanted it to be kind of a character-based thing, with you know someone related to the Heather character, you know, trying to find out what happened to her after all these years, and uh, and they wanted it to be you know found footage. And Adam and I were like, well, that feels like the right approach to us. You know, as fans, that was the sequel we always wanted to see. It's a different year. It's a different era now. You know, if you want to record something, you don't have this big, bulky, mini-DV tape camera you have to run, run around with. There's a lot of different technology right now. And you guys found ways to utilize those within the movie. And I found there was some very creative, even just from a, a photography point of view, 
being able to have that flexibility to shoot things in many different ways that, say, Eduardo couldn't have shot back in the day. When you're sitting down and start writing out this script, is that something you had in mind that you were able to have all those different perspectives and point of views? And how did that work into your creative process? Technology's evolved so much between the first film and our film that you know we knew we had to address that because I mean they spent half of the first film arguing over a map, which right. like you know <laughs> half the people that are seeing you know our movie this weekend have never uh, used a map before, you know, and, and don't know what one is. They they only have like maybe seen one framed at like Urban Outfitters, but like you know, so the camera thing was kind of interesting though. We knew we wanted the movie to look like beautifully ugly beautifully in a way. Like, ugly. Yeah, we weren't going to try to do the same thing the first film did because it did it perfectly and it exists. Like we had to kind of find the modern version of what that first film was able to do aesthetically uh, with its kind of unnerving use of high video and black and white 60 millimeter film and how it used that technology um, to create some really unnerving moments, like when you're seeing something from the 16 millimeter camera, which is having its sound recorded separately. So you're seeing something from the perspective of the camera operator, but you're hearing their voice from a distance. Right, yeah. Um, and, and moments like that in the original film, like, I don't think they give those filmmakers enough credit. One thing that kind of kept happening with each draft is Adam would just be like, make sure you mention that, like, someone's holding another camera in this scene. So we have a variety right. of, of, you know, and, and I'd be like, you know, I was just like, hey, we can put the camera in their hands at any time. He's like, yeah, if you do that, uh, the prop won't be there when we get to set. Right, like, make yeah. sure to point out that like th that someone is holding a different type of camera, so we just have a different angle and a different perspective and a different quality of footage to cut to. You guys made the narrative decision to follow the actual story of the original, having a family member tie throughout the two films. Why was that important to you moving into this, into this project? I wanted to make a Blair Witch sequel that didn't take a really long time to explain. Because, <laughs> <Like, laughs> you know, we could have gotten really bizarre with it, you know, obviously. We could have just gone straight into, like, the cult of the Blair Witch and some weird thing. And But I just don't... But, but then people just would have been like, I do not understand what you guys are talking about. Like, and, and, and you know, and, and we would have really been making movies for just, like, a diehard group of obsessives, um, which, which we'd already done with all our previous films. <laughs> so we were trying something different this time. You know, you're seeing an audience walking into the theater now. What's the experience you guys hope you've given to these people going in to see The Blair Witch? Well, we haven't actually seen anyone walk into a theater because we just we just <laughs> we just got back to LA. Um, we've been stuck in like various airports, but uh, you know, I, I we really just wanted to make something truly scary. I, I think you know, Adam and I are known as horror filmmakers to the extent that we're known at all. Right. But all our previous films were kind of comedies and and weird you know, tonally shifting kind of genre experiments. And you can tell that you, you can you can kind of pick up on your, your guys' sense of comedy throughout the film as well, which gets peppered in there. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, but I would say Blair Witch is our least comedic film, personally. Right. Um, and, and, and mainly that was because we wanted for once to do something that really scared people. We wanted mm. to make something really genuinely very scary. We hope that audiences this weekend just go and have like a scary good time. I mean, we wanted to make like a date movie. Um, I mean, I think all our movies are date movies, but, but the statistics do not support that hypothesis. So we wanted to really make something that was like fun and scary and a thrill ride. And, and you know, and uh, yeah, that's really it. I hope, I hope people uh, go into the theater, you know, looking happy and come out looking, you know, either more happy or deeply shaken. Well, I think you guys, for you guys, it's mission accomplished. Congratulations on the film. And don't forget, guys, Blair Witch is open now in theaters. You can head on out and see it at a local theater near you. Simon, thanks so much for coming in, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. What's up, Film HQ fans? Welcome to this week's Power Rankings. John, some much-anticipated movies hitting theaters this weekend. Do they make the Power Rankings? We shall see what's first. All right, coming in at number five, it's the third installment. It's Bridget Jones's Baby. Who would have thought this would have made the list? But somehow, some way, they found a way to take Renee Zell Zellweger, Colin Firth. They added McDreamy himself, Patrick Dempsey, to it. And you know what? It turned out to be a pretty damn charming little movie. Yeah. A really nice third installment for the franchise comes in at our number five spot. I think most fans want to know, do you see uh, Bridget Jones's granny panties for a third straight movie? I hope they do four more. <laughs> All right, what's in the fourth spot? All right, coming in the number four spot, the new Tom Hanks film, Sully. This film turned out to be a lot more riveting and interesting than I thought. How do you take a 208-second event and make it into a two-hour movie? I don't know, but somehow Clint Eastwood would find a way to do it. It's engaging, it's heartwarming, it's a human story at its core. 82% fresh rating from the critics. It's one you gotta go see. Sully comes in at number four. I thought uh, a little bit of Tom Hanks fatigue, some of his movies just haven't hit. Like, they th I thought they would. Sully knocked it out of the park. Tom Hanks, his biggest opening in seven years wow. with Sully. Wow. Okay, what's in the third spot? A little horror film that has charmed and shocked a lot of people. Don't breathe. Stephen Lang, the big baddie from Avatar, is back again as a 
victim of a break-in <laughs> entry that goes horribly wrong at 87% fresh rating. The critics are loving this and so are the fans. Even if you're not a horror guy, Josh, uh, yeah, uh, go and see Don't Breathe. This is a fun movie. Uh, I will say, uh, if you're going to break into somebody's house, do your research first. Yeah, uh, and who you're breaking into, <laughs> yes. <laughs> know your audience. All right, John, what's in the two spot? And number two is, to me, hands down, actually the best animated film of the year. And if it does not win the Oscar for Best Animated Film, I'll be shocked. It's Kubo and the Two Strings. Visually gorgeous. A triumph of utilizing slightly older technology with brand new technology with a great core of a fantastic story. Story. And, you know, it really goes well into playing off Western storytelling with Eastern storytelling, awesome. all kind of mixed into one in this really nice hodgepodge. It's a beautiful film. Make sure you check it out. Almost across the board, the critics love this film. 97% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. While you still have the chance, check out Kubo and the Two Strings. And you've got, uh, I mean, a huge animation here, and you still have Storks and Sing to come out this year. Yes, we do. A lot of competition. All right. What's our champion this week? Coming at number one, a nice little indie film that caught a lot of people off guard with a 98% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes and 91% audience rating. It's Hell or High Water. Okay. I've been saying for years, Ben Foster is probably the most underappreciated actor in the business today. You've got Captain Kirk himself playing alongside him, Chris Pine, and Jeff Bridges, who gives his best performance since he won his Oscar. You have to get out and see Hell or High Water, a great modern Western. You gotta check it out. And if you are the, one of the 2% that didn't rank this fresh in the critics, I don't know who you are, and I don't think I want to be your friend. All right, that's this week's Power Rankings, guys. The Witch is back this weekend. We will see the return of Blair Witch. So we decided here at Film HQ to rank our top five found footage movies in this week's top five. After its huge debut switcheroo at San Diego Comic-Con, Blair Witch finally premieres to the rest of the movie-going world this weekend. So, the team at Film HQ, fully equipped with camcorders and poor microphones, decided to break down our top five found footage movies. Destroying New York City in the fifth position is Cloverfield. If you just so happen to be in the right place at the right time when a monster a la Godzilla decides to take down your city, you better bring your camera. Something attacked the city. I don't know what it is. Uh, if, if you found this tape, I mean, if you're watching this right now, then you probably know more about it than I do. If you didn't have the camera, would anyone believe you? You got that close to the look out! Scaring the sheets off the bed in fourth place is 2007's Paranormal Activity. The movie centers around a young couple who put cameras in their bedroom and, oh, get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Make sure to keep those cameras running all night. You never know what goes bump in the night. <laughs> End of Watch, one of the most underrated movies of the last five years, races into third place. Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena star as the two green LAPD officers who take down international human traffickers while constantly filming their daily shifts. The way red corpuscles carry oxygen through the body, paperwork carries information through the department. Water corpuscles. David Ayer utilized dash cams, camcorders, body cameras, and a lot of gunfire in this gritty opus to those who protect and serve. Falling into a mystically powered cave hole place in the silver medal spot is Chronicle. Dane DeHaan and Michael B. Jordan had breakout roles in this supernatural found footage coming of age thriller. Give me a countdown. I okay? will, I promise. Ah! Oh, snap. Like I said. You got a paper right now. Like I said, see? See? Crap. Chronicle gave every high schooler partying in the woods hope that they might develop Jedi-like powers instead of a keg beer hangover. And finally, the movie that started the found footage revolution, The Blair Witch Project. This indie darling cost about $60,000 to make and left the box office five months later with over $240 million worldwide. I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. I'm gonna die out of here. This whole movie scared more people from venturing into the woods than any German fairy tale ever could. And that's our top five found footage movies here on Film HQ. If you have a video camera, a dream, or one scary idea, the next time people talk about a found footage movie, they could be talking about yours. I'm so scared. Okay, so one of the most interesting pieces of news came out this week. So Stan Lee's biopic Life Rights picked up by Fox, and they say they're going to do a picture on the life of Stan Lee, set in the 70s when Stan's in his 40s. Sounds interesting, except it's going to be an action thriller set in the vein, they say, of Kingsman and Roger Moore, James Bond. Look, the end of World War II. 
the future announcement when they come up with the cure for cancer and the day they announce this movie, the three most significant events <laughs> in the history of mankind. This, I'm telling you, besides the fact that they said The Force Awakens is coming, I cannot think of a piece of movie news I have been more excited about. Mark, am I getting a little too worked up for this, or is this truly the greatest thing ever? Oh, absolutely not, John, because you can take this and you can run with this concept. I ran into an old guy at Starbucks today, and he was about 90, about Stan Lee's age, and I just had to ask about this news. I was like, hey, so this guy Stan Lee, he's really old. They're going to make an action thriller about him in the 70s, and he looks at me, he's like, hey, kid, in the 70s, we were all superheroes. Oh, <laughs> yes! It doesn't have to end with Stan Lee. He can just be the, he can be the Stallone of this Expendables team that we're going to have with a bunch of old guys now back Back in the day, have them kicking ass. I love this idea. Sasha, what do you think about this? I, I mean, now that Mark just said that, I could not have been more excited, <laughs> and somehow I am. My big thing is I'm wondering who will they cast? Like, Stanley is so iconic, so who could possibly play him? Like, I'm running through scenarios, and I'm like, Hugh Jackman, maybe Bradley Cooper, but, like, who is good enough to be Stan Lee? That's the big question, but I think the fact that it's in the Kingsman vein, I love it. I cannot wait. I'm actually really big. Somebody dropped the suggestion on me, you and now I'm big really on big. it. Jason Lee. Right. I'm really what? big on the idea of Jason Lee. Because if you go back to Chase and Amy, he's already got experience playing a comic book Working guy. Working with mall rats, with yes, Stan Lee, talking exactly. about the things, you know, genitalia. So, <laughs> Snap, <laughs> what kind of direction could they even possibly go with a concept like this? As long as Jesse Eisenberg is not playing Stan Lee, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> hey, what I thought about the Hulk. Um, yeah, I, I want to see Excelsior be like the specter. Like, just come up with all of his, like, all of his weird, iconic catchphrases, the bullpen is actually actually the secret agent, you know, the layer where the, the desks all flip open and there's like, you know, he shoot, goes down some chute. It sounds insane. It sounds stupid. And I can't wait to see it. That's how, that's how I feel. I was like, it, it's better to have Stan Lee go into this weird world of like secret agents. As long as they don't forget about Jack Kirby is all I can say. Chris, where do they go with this thing? Well, there's actually a fake uh, a poster for a Stan Lee movie on, on the internet already where Brian Cranston actually is playing Stan mm, Lee, and he looks great right. with the big bushy mustache. He's like right the perfect age. I love the, I love this concept. I, I love this idea because his story is already iconic enough, but it'd be kind of like that Gong Show movie. Remember the Gong Show like biopic thing sure. they did where there's like this sort of Invented whole it. other world. He's yeah. like a CIA <laughs> agent or something. Like it could be like that. It's it's I, I think it'll be fantastic, but his real story is awesome enough. There's a great documentary about Stan Lee yeah. that you should all check out. Um, I love the idea that is like he's kind of a secret agent, but I mean he is a character from the, Mar the Marvel universe, right? Already, right. yeah. Stan Lee is. Is he the Watcher? We don't know. Is he a scroll? <laughs> yeah. Well, who yeah. says you just need one person to play Stan Lee? They could do like a Bob Dylan "I'm Not There" thing, where you right. just have yeah, like different five versions different people of Stan Lee. Like, uh, you have like the rib Stan Lee when he's got to go on a mission. You have the yeah. lover Stan Lee. Kate Blanchett <laughs> will be such a good Stan Lee. That's <laughs> is there any way that this movie, because it takes place in the 70s, doesn't open with the uh, Saturday Night Fever, just the shoes walking, <laughs> mm. we get some Bee Gees in there. It's going to be a disco-tacular time with Stanley in the 70s. All right, well, listen, one of the more social media-friendly filmmakers out there is, is actually Zack Snyder. He loves engaging with the fans online, and he has done it again. He put out a picture of what Batman looks like in the upcoming uh, Justice League film. Now, they, he's calling it the tactical Batman suit, and of course, you can see the image here. And what we see here is a little bit more of a Christian Bale Batman crossed with a Ben Affleck Batman crossed with a little bit of Night Owl. I kind of get the feeling of Schnepp. You had a chance to see these pictures. What were your reaction to them? I thought it looked cool. I mean, yeah, definitely he like uh, he went to the wrong closet. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, the Christian Bale closet. Oh, wait a minute. But I think it's cool. Batman has all these different outfits that he's used throughout you know, all the comic books, so it makes sense that Batman would have, he already, you already saw him in the, like, the super Frank Miller, Dark Knight the armor Battle to armor. fight Superman. Makes sense if it's, like, the bulked up, he has to, you know, he's gonna be fighting other metahumans, so it makes sense. They streamlined it. I can't wait to see those little, you know, night owl goggles turn all white. That's what I hope, so then he really looks just like the Batman from the comics. Because the, the shaped just like the Batman eyes from the comics, so. I think it's cool. It's a cool look. Chris, I have it on good authority that you're uh, you're a little bit of a fan of Batman. A little bit of a fan so of Batman. So I've been really curious about what your reaction was to these uh, images. I'll tell you exactly what my reaction
reaction was, I think it's tactically designed to sell lots of action figures. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Because, and this will not be yeah. the last bat suit that we see. Because if you remember when the original 1989 uh, Batman with Michael Keaton came out, there was a mold of Michael Keaton Batman, that action figure, that they did a hundred different versions where <laughs> Aqua Batman, yeah. Skywing Batman, Blue Batman, Pink Batman. We're going to see so many different Batman suits. But the Batman, the uh, Batman suits of, of the Ben Affleck version. I think it's going to go crazy. The one thing I, I do love that Zack Snyder shares this stuff, you're, sh you're oversharing. It's too much. I don't want to see anything from Justice League. Let's get to Wonder Woman. So, but, but I swear this will not be the last bat suit we see from Justice League. I think they're going to be five more suits. And I guarantee, I promise you, I look into camera and I promise you, world, <laughs> there will be an underwater Batman suit where he meets Aquaman in a bat underwater suit, and we're going to see it on the internet six months before the movie opens. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> now, one of the reasons why I kind of suspect why Zach is, is sharing these images now, why the Justice League trailer drops so early at Comic-Con is, I feel like, even though I'm one of the few people that kind of enjoyed Batman v Superman, I think Warner Brothers understood right now they wanted to change the conversation. They wanted to change the narrative. When you're talking about the Warner Brothers DC Universe now, they want you to talk about this new stuff, so they continue to to put this new stuff out and apparently it's kind of working because here we are talking about it but Sasha when you saw the images did they jump out at you did you like them and how many Batman suits do you think we're gonna see in this movie <laughs> I mean my big thing is we're talking about like the tactical suit right why are abs tactical why does he need to have all of those I've been trying to ask my wife that forever does that help anything I mean for me if you want to sell this you sell Batfleck. Ben Affleck, for me, was the best Batman we've had since Keaton. I think that putting him in that suit that looks very Night owl I mean, Patrick Wilson is pissed right now. <laughs> so much like what happened in Watchmen. I don't know that that's the smartest play. If they put him in with Aquaman, I would have been more excited. I think we will probably see three or four different suits, for sure. But this, like... What is tactical about this? I don't understand. Like, it's thicker. I get it. It comes out of the comic books. I like it. But this image, quite honestly, my first thought was, it's a little Batman and Robin-y looking to me. Oh. Not the suit, but the image around it. The sparks flying, the colors. Shots fired by Batman. <laughs> oh. She brought up the Schumacher Batman. <laughs> No. I will tell you what yeah. the tactic is. The tactic that this suit pulls off is that I didn't once look at this picture and think Martha. <laughs> I, I think that Why did you say your, that name? Why did you say I think that this is one of those course correction moves where it's like, hey, let's get excited about the future of DC and not necessarily look to some of the errors we might have made in the past. I love the way that this suit looks, even though I think from the eyes above, it's got a little bit of a flash dance. I'm just <laughs> welding some stuff before I dance the night away kind of vibe. Well, now if I'm this, excited. If this is See, night I'm out, excited. though, as, as John and Chris pointed out, if this is night out, I will paraphrase Jeff Daniels from Dumb and Dumber and say, that's a great hooter you got there. <laughs> and, but wait a second, by errors in the past, you mean all the movies, right? Don't you mean I don't much, hate the movies, though. The movies I just you know? think that there's been some issues with them that I would like to see not happen in the future. Like, the Martha thing was so huge for me, but I did love Batman. I think a lot of people love Batman right. and Batman That's v true. Superman. So seeing that we're going to get more Batman, different Batman, Batman with great abs is always a win. But did you love <laughs> Batman, or did you love Bruce Wayne as Ben Affleck played him? Oh, I don't have to choose one. Oh, I don't I know. Have to <laughs> yeah. I know why he's, he's got the tactical suit so he doesn't kill people. Oh, oh yeah, okay. well, let's not go into that again. But I will say this. I do like the look of it. I think it looks really slick. But if we see our first trailer and then the camera pulls back from this and we see him fighting a gang of neon light enthusiasts, <laughs> yes, then, yes. then we could be in a little bit yeah. of trouble. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, listen, that'll do it for us for this installment of Film HQ. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, make sure you follow all the great shows happening right now on Comic-Con HQ. And we'll be back again next week as well. So thanks a lot for being here. My name is John Campion. Until next time. Bye-bye.